Well, my apologies, but this is going to be Hellenistic uh, architecture at the speed of light. I think we are nearing architecture overload, and the temples, which we've covered, are really the most important Greek contributions to architecture. Hellenistic architecture, like Hellenistic sculpture, becomes more varied, more expressive, and sometimes, in keeping with the greatly expanded empire, simply much more vast. Uh, the sanctuary at Delphi is notable for its round structure and for its combination of Doric and Corinthian orders. Just as Hellenistic sculptors were more open to the experience of non-Greeks, uh, Hellenistic architects were more willing to mix up styles and experiment a little. So here you see the plan. Uh, you'll recognize, I hope, most of these terms like style of eight. But note this very clear depiction of a Corinthian capital. Uh, notice here the engaged columns. You remember those? We saw those back in Egypt, columns attached to the wall. Uh, and again, this is a use of this innovative new Corinthian capital. And indeed, the drum shape of this monument is itself uh, a new and innovative form, although we're going to see more of this in Roman architecture. Well, I may have spoken a little too soon about temples. I said the Greek temples were the most typical and famous Greek architecture. But in truth, their impressive theaters come at least to close second. Uh, in some ways, I think the theaters are even more fun. Uh, but they're pretty straightforward, and they really look a great deal like our amphitheaters today, which is not an accident. Note you can tell from this where we got our word for orchestra, and also our word for scene. The scene uh, is that rectangular structure uh, that was the backdrop for the theater. The action itself took place in the proskenian. Uh, this is, I'm not sure this is really even art history, but it is interesting that despite the really irregular shape of the spit of land that the city planners managed to impose an orthogonal or grid structure, uh, excuse me, orthogonal, uh, you'll note that that has in fact become the popular structure for many cities. And Brigham Young, among others, embraced it for uh, efficient city architecture. Okay. This is the one work that you really do need to know from the Hellenistic period. Pergamon was a major Hellenistic city in what is now Western Turkey. Uh, this is a tribute to King Adelos I's victory against the Gauls. And in best Hellenistic style, it is huge. It's designed to reflect the king's great wealth as well as his military victory. Pergamon is basically uh, a monument to showing off. Uh, the altar was located near the royal palace on the city's Acropolis, also near a library and some military buildings. So this was not simply a temple complex, uh, but rather a more uh, an administrative uh, and ruling structure. And by the way, this is not the actual altar. It's a reconstruction at a museum in Berlin. And the Cod Academy uh, podcast talks about why in Berlin they were eager to get these uh, impressive Greek monuments. Uh, here you see on the left a model that gives you some sense of how the altar fit into the Acropolis. And again, these were not just religious buildings. Uh, the second photo on the right shows the famous friezes at the bottom of the imposing staircase to the altar. Um, and we have another gigantomachy, or a fight between the titans and the family of gods that overthrow them. It is not an accident that there are so many echoes of the Parthenon in this. Adelos I wanted to identify with Athens, and he wanted his victory against the Gauls to be identified with the Turks' great vict excuse me, with the Greeks' great victory against the Persians. Uh, you should recognize in this frieze a lot of the Hellenistic elements we've seen in sculpture. The twisted bodies, the violent movement, the expressions of agony, the drapery that seems to be blowing in the wind. This isn't so much the wet drapery as the windswept drapery. Think of the Nike of Samothrace. Above all else, we have a sense of drama. This is sculpture as theater. And these are not gods standing serenely above the fray. They are fighting tooth and nail. 
Uh, Adelos I, as I said, wanted to identify his city with Athens, and hence Athena's prominent place in the phrase. But notice again how much more passionately she's portrayed, and this is even with her face missing, um, compared with the more sober Athena of the Parthenon, who we see emerging there. You've already seen these two sculptures, and I talked at the time about not only about their expressive power, but how it shows the sculptors and the culture's willingness to acknowledge the humanity and suffering of foreigners. I talked about empathy and a cosmopolitan atmosphere. Well, now you know where these sculptures belong, on the altar of Zeus and Pergamon. If you haven't already seen it, and if you have time, uh, I think it would be appropriate to end with the short uh, clip from The Secrets of the Parthenon that actually talks about the Temple of Didyma. Actually, I have a reason for encouraging this. Um, I, my family and I, including my then three relatively young kids, spent a month in Turkey touring, among other things, uh, the various Greek sites. And of all of the things that we saw, Didyma blew us away the most, not because it was the most beautiful or the most interesting, but because it was so huge, even unfinished. It is amazingly imposing. So I hope you have a chance to take a look. And we are through with architecture. After a quick look at painting, we will move on to Rome. <music>